Amen. So final installment in here of our wisdom series, and this is where we're contrasting now God's wisdom with the wisdom of the world. There is a, a, a so-called wisdom of this world that, that God says is actually foolishness. And God says that, that the wisdom of this world will be proved to be foolish. And, and it's, it, it, there is, it is proven in a lot of ways in our lifetime, like things are proved to be foolish that, that this world calls wisdom. But even if not in this lifetime, in, in heaven, we're going to find truth. And we're going to find real wisdom in heaven. But, but we're contrasting what God's word says with the wisdom of, of this world. And kind of the subtext or the byline of this series is going beyond Google. And, and uh, if there's ever an area that we need to, please listen to me, that we need to go beyond Google, it's in the subject that we're talking about today. Today we're talking about sex. And if you're new to discovery, I'm so sorry to put you in this awkward situation. But hopefully someone informed you and told you your junior high and high school kids, I want them in here, but just I want you to know, we have kids care for the younger ones. You can take them fifth grade and under. Uh, it, is, it is a parental advisory moment right now. Three, two, one, all bets are off. Let's go. Uh, so so this, in this topic of, of here's, here's the deal, you guys. Can I just I, I, can I put some comfort to you here? The church has been very silent on this for far too long, and I think we can become so bashful in this environment and no, 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 that type of, that type of stuff. Be, and maybe even when you have heard the church kind of speak out on this stuff, it's more like, stop it. Don't, don't, don't. Don't you do that. Stop that. Okay, now go and don't do that. You know, and that's kind of the extent of what we've heard a lot from maybe our, our religious or church experience. And so, but here's the deal. The, the world is not silent on this. The, it's definitely not. Look, and we have no problem with, with watching the TV shows with this, you know, rampant sexual activity, hearing music, the things that we listen to that, that, that has to do with promiscuity and sex and and, and, and people talk about it at work, and our friends are talking about it, and, and so, and so it's, it's out there. I'm telling you that it needs to be in here, too. We need to, we, you've heard, okay, you've heard the world's wisdom about sex. Can I just have a few minutes of your time to share with you God's wisdom about sex? I, I promise it'll be, it'll, if you just open up your ears, you just might be able to, to save your life. You know, that's what actually hangs in the balance here. That's what the, the, the proverb actually says in Proverbs chapter 7, verse 6 talks about this, that the window of my house, it says, I looked out through the lattice, and I saw among the simple, I noticed among them a young man, a youth who lacked judgment, who lacked judgment. And that's what we see a lot in our culture today. It's just people who just lack judgment. Where is right and wrong? Where is moral and immoral? The lines are so blurred. What's What's, what's okay and what's not okay? And, and is, is it okay to do this? And is it not? And it's, and it's just a lack of judgment. Proverbs, by the way, is, is, is that's why we're doing it in this series, a, book, a study of, of Proverbs. It is not silent on this subject of sexuality. There's Proverbs all the way from five. You ought to read all of it from five to seven. It's all about sexuality. It's all about adultery and, and, and fornication and, and guarding your life. And then there's other than these three chapters, there's 78 other verses in all of Proverbs. This is a huge topic in, in Proverbs. That's why we need to study. He says, man, don't lack judgment like this guy. He said he was going down the street near her corner where you shouldn't be. You're visiting that, you're, you're, you're visiting that site you shouldn't visit. Walking along in the, in the direction, like you're going in that direction in her house, of her, of her house at twilight as the day was fading, as the dark of night set in. Then out came the woman to meet him dressed like a prostitute and with crafty intent. Goes on to say in chapter seven, all at once he followed her like an ox going to the slaughter, like a deer stepping into a noose till an arrow pierced his liver, like a bird darting into a snare, little knowing that there is a price to be paid, little knowing that this just isn't a physical impulse like the world would have you believe, little knowing that it, this isn't just like an animalistic action that the world would have you believe that you need to satisfy, little knowing that there is a price for this. He says, it's going to cost you your life. See, I hope you have ears to hear today and hearts to receive, because what we're talking about actually can save your life. It, it can save your life. So the world's view that we're just animals. You heard 
boys will be boys. You hear that? Oh, boys, boys will be boys. It's just a physical thing and no big deal as long as, as, long as you're safe. As long as you're, it's consenting and you're safe. It's not safe. It's not safe. And we need to, that, that's the world's wisdom. The world has been so vocal about this, pushing their beliefs. What I'm saying, you guys, it's time for the church to be vocal as well. So that, so that we understand God's purpose. And just so you know, too, I, I talk to my kids. My, my, my junior high, two of my junior hires were in the last service. Sixth and eighth graders were in the last service. I began a conversation with them at fifth grade. You parents, if you are waiting beyond fourth and fifth grade, you're too late. And when you begin the conversation, it's not a one-time thing. I told my kids, I said, hey, I'd like to begin a conversation with you about, about this. And this is not just going to be a one-time thing. We're going to kind of, this is going to be ongoing throughout your junior high, your high school like, we're going to begin the conversation now because you're coming of this age. And so what I'd like to do with you today is kind of, for some of you younger ones in here, I'd like to parent you a little bit, maybe mentor you a little bit, okay? For those of you that are older, I, need, I want to pastor you a little bit today on this subject because if, if you are listening and have ears to hear, I'm telling you, this could, this could save your life. God's not silent on this subject, and, and, and we, need to, we need to start looking to see what God has to say about it. And if you really look to what God has to say about it, and you start to search the Bible, you're not going to get very far without finding sex show up in the Bible. You start reading it. In Genesis, it shows up. Genesis chapter 2, there it is. It's right there. Look at it here in your Bible. Genesis chapter 2, verse 22. Then God made a woman and brought her to the man this is it, Adam exclaimed. Oh, man, now it got good, God. Okay. I've been hanging out with these sheep and these animals. and Woo, this just got good. Okay, this is what he said. That's what he, he says. Wow, this is great. The man and his wife were both, look at this, they were both naked, but neither of them were embarrassed or ashamed. Why? Why were they? They were naked, but there was no shame because it was never God's intent for, for, for shame and, and, and regret and guilt to be found in the human heart. There was never God's intent for you to, for you to have that shame. What, what can we learn from this? It, 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 if you're in the right relationship or if you're, if you're operating in God's design in that relationship, you won't have any guilt or shame. Look, if there's guilt or shame in your relationship, you, can, you better believe that, that, that you're operating outside of the will of God in there. When you operate within God's will, there is no guilt. There is no shame. It's, it's God designed us that, that way. Someone said, one other time I was preaching on this topic, someone said to me, young man after the service, he's like, well, pastor, does that mean that if I'm godly, then I can, I can be comfortable with other people's nakedness too? And I said, no, stop it, stop it. You need to wait, young man, until you're, you're trying to find a, a way around there. That's not, that's not going to work, okay? Today I want to talk to you about God's design, the wisdom of God for your sex life, for sex God's design for sex. And then, and then we're going to look at the wisdom of this world and what the world has to say about sex. Three reasons why God created sex. Let me give them to you. Three reasons. Take some notes with me today. Here's the first reason that God created sex, and that is to produce children. God created sex to produce children. This is the very first command that God ever gave human beings. It was this, John, or Genesis 1, 28. God blessed them, the, the, the man and woman, and he said to them, be fruitful and increase in number, fill the earth and subdue it. This is the only command I think that human beings have obeyed, <laughs> right? This is, we've done a good job at this one, God. I got three of them. I'm doing good, man. I'm doing my part. I don't know about you, but I'm obeying God in my part, okay? But it's sad. What's sad is that many people don't, don't know God's design for sex beyond this. So many people, Christians alike, think that the only reason God created sex was to produce children, for procreation, so we can have kids and have a human race, and, and that's why God created sex. What a, what a narrow, just, just un, unbiblical, really, view of sexuality. There's actually more reasons. Let me give them to you. The more, more reasons of why God created sex. Here's number two. God created sex to promote unity. He created sex to promote unity between a husband and a wife between a man and a woman in marriage. And now culture may tell you something differently, but God's word says that sex is, is to promote unity between a man and a woman. It is the bond that bonds husbands and wives together. It is, it, it, the, another word for this, you might why don't, why don't write down the word intimacy. It's to promote that, to promote unity, to promote intimacy. The, the definition of intimacy is to be known 
are to know and to be fully known. To know and to be fully known. That is, that is, that is what God desires for us. There's, in Mark chapter 10, Jesus actually re- is repeating a scripture that, that is repeated five different times throughout the whole Bible. You, you probably know it. It says in Mark 10, 7 and 8, For this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and be united with his wife. Some of you may, may be more familiar with the King James Version. To cleave, right? The leave and cleave thing. He shall cleave unto his wife. That word right there for united or cleave means to, in that, in that Greek word which the New Testament was written in, it means to, to adhere to, to stick to, to bond with. It is, it is, what he's saying here is that there is a, what, it, sex is created to tie our souls together. You ever heard of soul ties? That's where it comes from. It comes from this word, to cleave, to adhere, and be united, to stick to. Okay, so what, what happens is that, is that when we, when we treat sex outside of God's design and we treat it so lightly, it's like a, it's like a piece of tape. Okay, there's, there's a sticky part of the tape, right? You ever stick something on, okay, I want this stuck up right here. You ever try to reuse that piece of tape? It's not as good the second time, is it? So this is what we do. We, well, okay, you know, I don't like it there anymore. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take it down. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put it over here now. And, okay, and then I'm going to put it over here. I'm going to put it over here. And you just move that thing around. Eventually, you got, you, you got no sticky power, okay? Some of you, so, okay, so this, this, is, this is what's happening in your relationships. You bond, you unite, you cleave, you adhere to, your souls adhere to another person. And then you rip your soul apart and you go adhere to another. And you rip your soul apart and you adhere to another. And then you wonder why you're not satisfied in your relationship after the fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth one. It's because you've created a pattern of your soul that is used to adhering and ripping and you don't have no sticky power left. I'm going to get to some hows on, on how you can get that back. But this is, this is, why, this is why sex is so dangerous. It's, it's very beautiful. God made it, made it beautiful. He made it to promote unity, but it's also dangerous. Look what 1 Corinthians chapter 6, 16 says. There's more to sex than mere skin on skin. Gosh, it's more than just physical, you guys. Sex is, is as much a spiritual mystery as it is a physical fact. It is written, as it is written, the two shall become one. Sex is the physical expression of a spiritual truth. Are you hearing me, guys? Sex is, it's the physical expression of, of a spiritual truth. Something already is happening and uniting with, with, this, with uh, the soul of another person. God wants a husband and wife to be united. There's a third reason that God created sex as well. And, and this is, I think this is kind of funny when you think about it, really, because God created God created sex. I mean, okay, so there was a time where sex didn't exist. There was a time before, and then there was just water and land and trees and vegetation, and then there were animals. And I think it's just a funny thought that God, in the middle of all that, in the middle of creation, God goes, ah, I got a great idea. He got a really good idea here. And then the angels go, well, what, what is it, God? And he goes, you're not going to appreciate this. Don't worry about it. He's just, I, I know what I'm going to do. And he creates sex. And he creates it to be fun. And it, write it down this way. Sex, sex is created to provide enjoyment. Look, if God, cre- God created it that way, that you would like it and you would enjoy it, he created it. Why did he create it that way? Why, why, why? Not, n- not to tempt you and, to, and for you to just kind of give it out to whoever you want. No, no, no. He created, look at Proverbs chapter 5. Again, God's not silent on this, you guys. It may make you blush, but God ain't blushing about it. Proverbs 5 says, May your fountain be blessed, and may you rejoice in the wife of your youth. A loving doe, a graceful deer, may her breast satisfy you always. I can say that when I'm saying it in Scripture, okay? <laughs> may you ever be captivated by her love. What I like was the amen over there. I don't know who it was. It was like, amen, come on. That's awesome. Um, <laughs> some say, I've already discovered this one. This is good. But look, maybe you haven't discovered it to the extent that God desires you to, like the, the, the degree that God intended. If we're honest, look, most of us here, here have, we have not been, we don't experience the enjoyment to the extent God has desired. Most of us here have experienced emotional pain because of sex. If we're honest, 
Statistically, most of us here have experienced some emotional pain because of sex. And, and some are even dealing with physical issues because of sex. Some, are, some aren't even, they're having a hard time to find joy in it. We're looking to medication or enhancements, things to enhance our sexual experience. God's design for marriage is awesome. But when we allow it to be twisted and distorted in our lives, we cheapen it. We cheapen the value of sex. The title of today's message is Cheap Sex at a High Price. There is a high price for cheap sex. I want to give you three forms of cheap sex today, okay? The three forms of the world's wisdom. I'm going to talk to you a little bit about the world's wisdom and then the result of it. But there's three forms of cheap sex. Write them down. Here we go. Let's expose the darkness together. Number one is recreational sex. Recreational. Some people have cheap recreational sex where the wisdom of the world says sex is just physical. If nobody gets pregnant, if nobody gets a sexually transmitted disease, if it's, if, if it, if it's consensual, if nobody gets hurt, then have a good time. Have a good time. It's just physical. It's like ping pong, okay? It's like flag football. It's more like tackle football. <laughs> more like tackle football and hold them down as long as you can on the ground. But it's like, it's just physical. So it's just, it's, there's no big deal about it, okay? We, and we don't realize that sex is so much more than a physical impulse. It's a spiritual act. Yeah. Sex is a spiritual act. God designed sex to unify, to tie the souls of a man and a woman in love and unity. To, to, it's beautiful. It's magnificent. The Bible even calls it a mystery, that it's mysterious, but it is, never calls it recreational. That's right. That's right. If sex is just physical, some of you think maybe that. If sex is just physical, then tell me why. A child who's been sexually abused can carry that wound around with them their entire life, affecting relationships, affecting their future, affecting their, their all other behaviors. Why, if it's just physical? Why, why do we need to go through so, so much therapy and care with that child? If it's just physical, why, not, why don't we just tell the kid, put on your big boy pants and get over it? It's just physical. Because it's not. Why, why, if it's just physical, why would a woman being raped is so much more traumatizing than a woman being beaten? A woman being raped will will feel so much shame and so much guilt. She'll she'll even sometimes try to hide it from everybody because she doesn't want no one to know about this experience that she's been through. That's why sometimes it never even it never even gets discovered. They take it with them forever, or late in life they tell about it. Why? Because sex is more than just a physical act. It touches the deepest part of your being. If you treat it as just physical, you're going to end up hurting yourself. You're going to end up hurting your future spouse by your experience. Sex is not just physical. That's why the deepest wounds that we can have are sexual wounds. That's the deepest wounds. Why is it that when, when someone comes up to me and says, Pastor, I need to talk to you, and they, and, they, and they begin with something like this. They say, I need to tell you something that I have never told another soul in my life. Why is it I know 99.9% .9 of the time what they're going to tell me? I mean, in my experience, I just in 99.9%, .9 if, if the conversation begins a little bit like that, I know where it's going. It, it, let me say this. It has never gone, when someone begins a conversation like that, I mean, it's never gone with like, you know, I cheated on my taxes last year, Pastor. <laughs> I yelled at my wife. You know, I, I beat my kids. Nothing like that. Nothing. It's, it's and I, I'm telling you, with a high percentage that, that people, they, they say, you know, I, I did this, like I, I, I was drunk, or I was on, it was, it was at, you know, Mardi Gras, and we got, or whatever, and I, you know, it was just one-time thing, and we did it, and then she called me later, she said she was pregnant, I said, I'll give you the money for abortion, and she said, no, I, I, I want to have it, and I said, then fine, you're on your own, I walked away, and I buried it for so many years, Pastor, I need to tell you, I need to tell someone, it's killing me, why is it that sexual wounds are the deepest wounds that we could ever experience, why? Because it's more than just physical, it's more than just physical physical. The wisdom of the world says, you need, to, you need to find out what you like, though. Isn't that what they say? That you, you, need, oh, you won't know what you like when you get married. You're going to get married to someone, and then you're not going to know what you like. Or another one is like, don't you want, you need to be good at it. You want to be good at it by the time you get married, so you can please your wife or your husband. Let's get serious. Come on now. That's what it's, I, I've heard it, okay? Which is just ridiculous. You were never supposed to sexual prowess and sexual, the sexuality of someone was never supposed to come into the equation of lifetime love and unity. It was never supposed to. You were never supposed to bring that into the equation. You were supposed to get good at it together. 
You're supposed to learn and explore together. It was supposed to be an added benefit and enjoyment of unity and beauty and mystery together, not weighing the pros and cons of how sexually they can please you. Recreation, cheap recreational sex. Here's the second type of cheap sex is occupational. Occupational sex. Or, um, and I'm not talking about what you probably think there. The, the wisdom here is, is this, is, is well, we're going to get married anyway. Or just, this is the person I love, though. This is, my, this, is my, I lo- this, is my, this is my life. This is my partner. And this is just like, I'm monogamous. With it. This is, I'm in, that's it. I'm just having, with this one person, I'm going to get married to them anyway. Look, we know what God, look, we know what God says about this. You hear what God says about this. I'm not even going to tell you. Can, let's just put God's, God's word even aside of this. And let's just look at the facts. Okay, because I explored the facts of what living together and having sex before marriage actually does. The wisdom of the world tells you you need to actually move in together, and you need to try it on, and you need to have sex, and you need to do those do those things. And because because you got to know and then make the decision. Well, let's God's word aside. Let's look at the facts. I just looked at the facts. The U.S. Attorney Legal Services, about as unbiblical as you can get. Okay. Here's what the facts say, that living together before a marriage does not accomplish the goal that couples think it will. If a couple does not live together prior to marriage, at the five-year mark, they have a 20% chance of being separated. If a couple does live together before getting married, at the five-year mark, they have a 49% chance of being separated doesn't work. Look, and then, and then at the 10-year mark, okay, at 10 years, the, the, it jumps to 33% for those who did not live together before marriage. They will have a 33% chance of being separated at 10 years. It jumps to those who, who, who are lived together and haven't committed at the 10-year mark are 69% likely to be separated. So, so let, me, let, me, let me explain it. The longer that you stay together and continue having sex before marriage and cohabitating, the less likely you'll be with that person in the future. That is the facts. And that is why the wisdom of this world will always prove to be foolishness. And God, I'm telling you, can I just say, God's way is better. God's way is better. He's not trying to limit your life and confine your life. to just, He's trying to release your life in freedom of his design. You see, when you operate in God's design, there is so much freedom and joy and fulfillment. It's how he created you. When you be who God has created you to be, it's beautiful, powerful. Here's the... Here, another, another term you may have heard is like, some say, wouldn't, you wouldn't buy a car without test driving it first, would you? You, ever that? you wouldn't buy a car without, people are not products that you, that you commit to one day, and then once she's got some miles on her, once she doesn't look as good anymore, she's a little bit run down now, that you trade her in for an upgrade, okay? People are not products. And ladies, can I tell you, stop Stop putting it out there like it is. Stop dressing like a commodity or else people will treat you like one. A fisherman, a fisherman when they go fishing, what do they fish with? Bait, right? There's different types of baits for different type, different type of fish. Look, if, if all you're putting out there, if all your bait is your body, if you're baiting people with your body, all you're going to catch is body snatchers. Here we go. Recreational, occupational. Here's the third kind of just, it, it, gets, it gets to the worst of worst is, is obsessional. Cheap, obsessional sex. Like there's this whole secret side that no one knows about that you are caught up in. Your pornography, sex, like you organize your life around it. You think to yourself, man, if someone knew like what I really was doing, they would just dog me out. They would not. Treat, they, and you find yourself orbiting your life around what I call the dog bed. It's that you, you're acting like an animal. And so we eat dog food, we look at dog food, and we've, we've reduced our sexuality to this animalistic action, and so we're acting like dogs. 
A lot of people are feeding on dog food. The world tells you, you're a dog. You are an animal. Lust here, lust there. Go get it. Go get it. Just get yours. Go be happy and get yours. As long as, it's, as long as you're safe and consenting, just no one's getting hurt, go get it. It's okay. That's, that's, that's Steve Hirsch, the CEO of Vivid Entertainment. This guy is probably drives more pornography than anybody in the world. He, he said this. There's a quote from him. He said, not only does hardcore porn not shock people today, but I think they want more. Harder and harder and harder and harder which is a chilling statement on the backdrop of Ephesians chapter 419 in your notes. Having lost all sensitivity, one translation says, having their conscience seared as with a hot iron, they've given themselves over to sensuality so as to indulge in every kind of impurity with a continual lust. That's what it'll leave you with, a lust for more. I'm telling you, it's dog food. Are you, buy, are you a dog? Are you buying into that junk? I'm telling you, that's what the world will tell you you are. And then after we have sex, and physically, mentally, and, and in other ways, even emotionally, we throw up. We, we vomit physically, spiritually, emotionally. And it's like, we, and then, and then we, we, we return to that vomit, the Bible says, just over and over. It's what Proverbs says, 26 says, as a dog returns to its vomit, so a fool repeats his folly. And as we repeat these destructive patterns in our relationships and in our souls, there are some There are some effects, some results that it has. Write them down with me. Here are the results of cheap sex. Cheap sex will leave you feeling unworthy. Unworthy. Um, The we have a I have a Ming vase here with me today, or or something similar. Where is this? You guys, the the Ming vase comes from uh, the Ming Dynasty, and and Ming Dynasty was from 1300s to to the 1600s. And, and these are some of the most expensive, uh, valuable vases like on, on the market. They were originally used to like honor diplomats and, and for officials. And as they would come to China, they would, they would give these. And like as they were creating treaties, thank you, as they were creating um, alliances and treaties and things, they would often send these. And this was before anyone had things like this, but it was the beautiful white, you know, creamy white with blues and and it was just, this marks kind of the, the Ming vase of the Ming dynasty. Um, up here in, in the front, John, you got soft hands? Yeah? Why don't you put that down? Here you go. Why don't you pass it around to the front there? Yeah, just pass it around. Just, would anyone, would anyone treat a Ming vase like this? Like, can I, can I tell you something? That how much more valuable, here you go, give me that. Can I tell you, you are so much more valuable than porcelain. That, that, that this is replaceable. You can buy more of these. And the reason, why, the reason why John was like, and everyone went, ooh, when I threw it was because I told you the value of it. Because you knew the value and the purpose of it. Can I tell you something? Anything that you do not know the value or the purpose of, you will end up misusing and abusing. You end up misusing and abusing everything you don't know the value and the purpose of. So if you don't know the value and the purpose of money, per se, you're going to end up abusing and misusing your money. If you don't know the value and the purpose of people and relationships, all they are going to be to you is misused and abused for your own pleasure. If you don't know the value and the purpose of God's design for sex, you will just misuse and abuse sex. So, so what would happen if I... If, if I didn't know the value of this and I, try, and, I tra- and I treated it like it was something else, like of something of less worth or treated it with maybe like, like it's not even intended to be. Like I tried, to, I tried to play basketball with this thing. What do you think will happen? If I tried to bounce it. And some of you, listen, some of you feel that way with your sexuality right now. Some of you have been passed around. You feel a little, maybe, maybe this isn't a picture of you, but maybe some of you feel passed around. Maybe you feel a little bit smudged, a little bit cracked, but others of you feel just like this. You feel shattered. You feel worthless. Who could, who could want me now? I'm broken. I'm, un, I'm unworthy. Some of you are, are lucky. Maybe you've passed it around long enough and you don't, you're not shattered yet, but you feel unworthy. This isn't a Ming Dynasty vase, by the way. You can breathe. <laughs> You are, look, that's replaceable though. I don't care, I don't care what, it, what era it came from, how much it costs, you can get another one of those. You have one life to live. You have one life. 
You have, you have the, the decisions of how you treat your sexuality one time, this one life. You are so much more valuable than porcelain. This is replaceable. You are irreplaceable. And even, listen, some of you may even feel a little passed around or broken and unworthy here today. God specializes in redeeming broken things. You know what redeem means? It means to bring back the original value, to redeem something. The enemy would like you to believe that you are unworthy because of maybe the decisions you've made, the choices that you've made, but it is not the truth. That is a lie from the enemy. This is what the Bible says, 1 Peter chapter 1. For you know that it was not with perishable things, such as silver or gold, that you were redeemed with the empty, from that empty way of life handed down from you from your forefathers, but with the precious blood of Christ, a, a, a lamb, he says, without blemish or defect. That, you know how valuable you are? How valuable we are? The price of something is, is determined by how much someone is willing to pay for it. And, and God was willing to pay his blood for you. You are valuable. You are precious. But when you have cheap sex, the enemy lies to you and you feel broken and unworthy. Here's the second thing that cheap sex will do to you. Write it down this way that we feel unloved. That's what it'll do. It just, it just, the, the, this is the, the enemy's tool for you to be isolated. He, does not, he knows the power that intimacy and unity God's way has in your life. That God's designed to unite at the deepest level a husband and wife. He would love to just keep you unsticky. Unsticky your whole life. Feeling unloved. Unsticky, unworthy, and unloved. I'm totally unloved. Some of you feel no one loves me. If they knew what I was involved in, if they knew the websites I visited, if they knew the people I was talking to, if they knew the clubs I was going to, if they knew the beds I was sleeping in, I was just, who could love me? Who, who could love me? I'm telling you, that's not true. That is a lie of the devil. Romans chapter 5, verse 8 tells you how much you're loved, that God demonstrates his own love for us in this while we were in the dog bed. While you were, you were in your mess, while you were eating the dog food, while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. You are, look, it doesn't matter what you do. It doesn't matter the decisions even you made. God's love for you is unchanging and unending. You are loved. It's a lie of the enemy. That's what cheap sex will have you buy into. You feel unworthy. It's not the truth. You have value above, above even how you treat yourself is how God sees you. You are loved beyond measure. You are loved. Here's the third thing that cheap sex, the result of cheap sex, that we feel unfulfilled. Unfulfilled. Because most of us, we're going, we're seeking sexual pleasure for fulfillment in some ways. We, we, we want, some of us just want to feel loved. We want to feel accepted. We want to feel wanted. We want to feel cared for. So some of us want to, want to, you know, we want excitement maybe. Some of us want thrills, but, but cheap sex will never fulfill you like you think it will, where you, where you think like sex is like the biggest thing, like it's what you organize your life around. Philippians 4.19 actually says this about your fulfillment. And my God will meet all your needs according to his glorious riches in Christ Jesus. You see, the only place you can find the fulfillment at the deepest level of your soul is in Christ. You don't find fulfillment in your, in your sexuality. You were never supposed to. That wasn't God's design for you to find fulfillment in sexuality. Your fulfillment was always designed for you to find in a relationship with your God, your Savior, your King Jesus, your best friend. That's where we find our fulfillment. But cheap sex will keep leaving you unfulfilled, chasing for more, going after the vomit again. And most of us are feeding on dog food. Instead, you need to feed on the Word of God. You need to feed on the Word of God corporately. You need to feed the Word of God privately. Right tucked away in, 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 in the middle of Proverbs 5 and 7 and Proverbs chapter 6 and it is an intentional verse when it's talking about your sexuality and how to guard your life. God puts in the middle of those chapters... This verse, Proverbs 6, 23 through 26. For these commands are a lamp. You see, the word of God is a lamp to your feet, a guide to your path. 
These commands are a lamp, he says. These teachings is a light, and the corrections of disciplines are the way of life, keeping you from the immoral woman, from the smooth tongue of the wayward wife. Do not lust in your heart after her beauty or let her captivate you with her eyes, for the prostitute reduces you to a loaf of bread, and the adulteress preys upon your very life. Don't tuck yourself away just yet. I know I gave you all the fill-ins in the scriptures, but I, I have just, up here on the screen, there's three responses. After a message like this, you really have, there's three different responses I kind of, I see people wrestling with, generally. And, and, and one response you may be having right now is defensiveness. Maybe some of you get defensive at, at, at the nature of uh, uh, what I'm talking about, maybe a little offended by, and I hope that's not the case. I hope your, your walls didn't come up high enough for God to, to just show you how much he loves you. The, the second response um, after a message like this is, is remorse. Or we just feel bad. We feel bad. Remorse in and of itself is not, is, it will do us no good, though. And I, hope, I really hope you don't leave here today defensive or remorse, like feeling bad about yourself. On the contrary, I hope you know your worth. I hope you know your value. I hope you know how much you are loved and accepted by God, no matter who you are, who you've been with, or what you've been doing, that God loves you. And it's unchanging. The last response that I hope that you will have after this message is, is a response of uh, repentiveness, to be repent, repentive. And, and, and re, 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 repent is this biblical word, but it, it just means that we were going in one direction. That's what it, it literally means to turn around and go the opposite direction. It means I was going in this direction. I was bought into the world's way. I thought it was right. You know, I didn't, I didn't think any different. I thought that's what I was supposed to do. I thought I was supposed to live with her. Or I thought I was supposed to have sex because I love her. And she's going to be the one. I thought, but it's the world's way. Today, I'm turning direction, and I'm going towards God's will. I'm going towards God's way. You see, I, I, I hope you don't feel like God is pointing or I'm pointing out anything in your life. On the contrary, I'm not pointing anything out inside of you. What I'm pointing out is towards truth. I'm saying, hey, check it out. There's a way that seems right to you, but, but in the end, it's going to lead in death. Here's God's way, and I'm telling you, it's better. Factually, it's better. You just, Bible aside, look at the foolishness of the world and the results that it does. God's way is better. Turn, please. Turn and follow God. I'm telling you, you'll find more fulfillment, more love, more satisfaction, more enjoyment than doing it the world's way. You got some communion elements as you came in. And I thought this would be a beautiful picture of a covenant I'm going to ask every one of us to renew today in light of our, in light of our study today. The Bible says that we are to do this in remembrance of Christ's death and of his suffering, that this juice represents his blood and the, the bread represents his body. See, the, the blood always represents, listen, the blood always represents life. In the Bible, anytime you, you see blood, it represents life. The blood of an animal, the life of uh, an animal is in the blood. The life of, a, of the creation is in, in the blood, Leviticus tells us. When you take the blood, you're making a covenant with God and you're saying, not my life, but yours. I want your life, God. I want to live for you. That's the covenant we are making when we take the, the, the blood, okay? The covenant that we are making when you take the bread is your body was broken for me. And my body is not my own. It was bought and paid for with a price. And so today, as we prepare your heart to receive this, the communion today, today, the, the blood represents that. It represents the life of Christ, that you were to live for him. Maybe this is the first time you're going to make a decision like this, like to live for God. And, to, and, and if that's you, you can make it today. You can choose today. Nothing needs to hold you back from receiving Jesus Christ as your Lord today. What that means is just, is just where you're saying, God, I want to live for you. Jesus, I make you my Lord, and in your blood was shed for me. So from this day forward, I surrender, and my life is yours. Hey, if that's the covenant you want to make with God today, will you go ahead and take the juice? Thank you, God. Here's the next covenant. It's the same covenant. It's inside the same thing. That your body 
was broken for me, Jesus. And today, come on, today, Jesus, I'm making a commitment to you. Will you make this your prayer? Today, I'm making a commitment with you, Jesus, a covenant with you that I'm not going to follow the world's way any longer. I'm not going to follow the wisdom of the world when it comes to my body. But your body was broken in for me, and I make a covenant today that my body is not my own, that you bought my body by the stripes that you bore, by the blood that you shed. Today I make a covenant with you that my life and my body is yours. In Jesus' name, take the bread.